I actually just want to start off by thanking Steve, Bob, and Bob. Everything they've talked about, I don't even have to say anything, so my presentation's pretty much done. <laughs> it's all going to be a reiteration of, uh, of, of things that they've, they've talked about. And I know in a lot of cases we, you know, we come in and we, we talk to people, and a lot of the things we know a lot of the people in the crowd agree with. And it's, it's speaking to the converted, otherwise why would you be here? The people that typically don't come to these types of things are the ones that don't come to the AGMs in your minor hockey association that aren't involved. And they're also the ones that are usually the squeakiest, uh, squeakiest wheel. So appreciate everyone spending some time on, a, on another weekend. Uh, I've been with Hockey Canada f since 97, so about 20 years. My email's on the front page of the Hockey Canada website. So I get about 100 emails a day. Everything from how tight should I tie my daughter's skates to I can't believe you guys are using this four check with the uh, Olympic team. And everything in between. And when we do well in international competition, I get emails from Sweden and Russia and Finland and our friends from the south about how we cheated, we paid off the refs, we got lucky, you name it. When we don't do well, I get emails from every crackpot in Canada about what's wrong with our goaltending, our defensemen, our scoring. Probably got one from someone in here at some point. I actually, I actually have an email uh, folder in my email called beauties. And I got about 500 emails in there that I've saved over the years from people that have decided to, to send me stuff on, like I said, all, you name it, anything and everything. But it does go to show the passion that people have for the hockey. Bob's right, it's a, it's a global game. Um, we strive to do as much as we can for the game in Canada. We also feel, as a hockey nation, we have responsibility to, to, to help other countries out as well. And we share a lot of stuff back and forth between the U.S. and, and the Finns and the Swedes and not so much the Russians, but everyone else, we're, we're always trying to learn. There's, there's things that we do really well, there's things that other countries do really well. We try and learn from other sports. Steve has a wealth of knowledge, not just dealing with hockey, but it's dealing with athleticism and developing athletes and doing the right thing. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what sport you're involved in. If you go about things the right way, you're going to have a better chance to get more kids to the highest levels, but you're going to have an even better chance to keep more kids involved in sport. And in the, in the big picture, that's the most important thing. It really is the most important thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some long-term player development. I know you guys have, have heard the phrase already today, but how it ties into what you're doing in your minor hockey associations. We're going to talk about some physical literacy. We're going to talk about some multi-sport. But I also want to get a chance to leave you guys with some things that you can take back to your associations. Things that you can try and incorporate tomorrow, next week, next year. I know the hockey season started already. You're going to have see some things up here that you might not be able to do now, but you can start to incorporate next year. Our goal, lead, develop and promote positive hockey experiences. Doesn't matter if it's a five-year-old coming onto the ice for the very first time, or if it's an Olympic athlete, our job is to make sure it's a positive hockey experience. That means for volunteers, coaches, officials, timekeepers, doesn't matter who it is, that's what it has to be. And the number one thing when it comes to kids when I look at it, is coming to the hockey rink has to be a great experience. For some kids, that's the best experience they're going to have that day. It's the best experience they're going to have all week. It might be the best experience they have all month. There's lots of things going on at home. There's lots of things going on at school. The arena and the hockey rink needs to be a safe play, place where kids can come and participate, get physical activity, and enjoy it. If those things aren't happening, then we're, we have a, a big problem with what we're doing with hockey. I'm going to show you a little video called The Canadian Way. At our office, this is how we view hockey in this country. The Canadian way, for more than 100 years, hockey has been our passion. Played on ponds and rinks from coast to coast. After school with your friends, Saturday night with your family. Hockey brings us closer together. It inspires us. It's our way of life. And to many, it's what defines us as Canadians. From the first time you hold the stick, in your driveway or anywhere there is ice, the 
So there's a little video on how we look at hockey from our office in Calgary. It's not about high performance, it's not just about development, it's about the entire pathway. And as we've heard earlier, training for five and six year olds is training for the Olympics. Because we want to make sure that they have a good start in the game, they learn the game, they have fun, the passion, everything that it takes to develop is what it takes to get someone to get to that level. If at any stage along the way some of those things don't happen, we see kids who leave the game. Steve talked about it. We see kids, boys especially, 15 years old, they start leaving the game if it's not fun, if they don't see themselves having an opportunity to continue. And that happens in a lot of places in this country. Yes, we have 560,000 kids playing the game. But you look at the, the growth that they're having in the U.S., they're going to surpass us in numbers before too long. So there's a lot of things that we need to do as, as organizations to make sure that we do the right thing. Here's our chart for long-term player development. Very similar, eight, nine stages. And it's about doing the right thing at the right age. At the end of the day, you look at USA Hockey, you could look at soccer, you could look at basketball, you could look at volleyball. Of the 67 national sport organizations in Canada, everyone is mandated to have a long-term player development pathway or philosophy. It's not a program. It's something that should be ingrained in everything that we do. As more and more people start getting familiar with the terminology about long-term player development, long-term athlete development, long-term coach development, long-term officials development, it's about doing the right thing at every single stage to get more people involved and keep them there longer. And when we do that, we're going to have a successful sport organization. And Sport Canada looks at all sport in Canada as a sport organization. So we're trying to get everything 
into a pipeline where people are doing similar things, but it's the right thing at the right age. So for us, we want to establish that gold standard in hockey. Does that mean everything is there all the time? No. But that's the goal. We want to get everything to the highest level we possibly can. Participants have to have a positive experience and has to build on a strong skill base. And that's important. Kids who can skate, handle the puck, and think can play any system that a coach wants them to later on. But if you don't have the fundamental skills, hockey is not an easy sport to play in and participate in. Golf is probably the only sport you can be really, really bad at, but you go back and play with your buddies every Sunday. <laughs> but hockey, for a lot of kids, if you haven't learned the fundamental skills, it makes it easy for them to step away. And so the more we do that at the young age, the better off we're going to be. We talked about a little bit earlier, 10 years, 10,000 hours. It takes a long time for someone to reach an elite level. And that's general. It's not an exact science. And it's not just structured. It's activity, taking into account ball hockey, pond hockey, other sports, time you spend on your BMX bike, time you spend on your skateboard, all those, those athletic type of things contribute to your success in other sports. But it does go to show that it takes a long time. Your average player starts playing hockey at five or six. Not too many 18-year-olds in the NHL. So it takes longer than 10 years in hockey to get to elite levels. And it's okay for parents to want their kids to get to the National Hockey League or to the Women's Olympic team. We 100% think it's okay for parents to want their kids to get there. But we think if they go about it the right way, they're going to have a better chance. And that's the number one thing that we have to try and get across to people, is doing the right thing at the right age. But in order for those 10,000 hours or 10 years to come into play, they have to have developed fundamental skills. So in our sport, you have to skate, shoot, pass, handle the puck, think, all those types of things. And they have to be physically literate. And that's one of the best parts about the initiation program, the novice program, the eight and under program they have in the US. It is about teaching kids all the different skills that they're gonna need to have. It's not flow drills, it's not structure, it's not power plays or penalty kills. It's about teaching the skills that the kids need to play the game. It's interesting when Bob was talking, when I was coaching Pee Wees a couple of years ago, I had two rules. Can't dump it in, can't dump it out. Takes no brains whatsoever or skill to do either one of those. So at the start of the year, we had defensemen. They might as well have been delivering pizzas to the other team in front of the net. As I said, you can't, you can't rim it around the boards for no reason. You got to skate it. You got to pass it. Go to open ice. Tell our forwards you cannot get to the red line and just shoot the puck in the corner for no reason. Yeah, sometimes they want to get a change and they got to leave the ice, so there's exceptions. And I could tell within two minutes of a game how we were going to do. If the other team just tried to rim it out on us or just throw the puck in when they got to the red line, I knew we were going to win every single game, every single time. But when we played another team who had the same philosophy, then I knew it was going to be a tough game. Because then it was matching skill and thinking and all those things together. And I still believe in those two rules. Don't dump it in, don't dump it out. Have kids try and make plays with a purpose. Some of the drawbacks in our system, over-competing and under-training. It's been talked about already. The more games you play, the less chance you have to develop individual skills in kids. The amount of puck time they have on a game, we saw a stat, one efficient practice is more skill development than 11 games collectively. We still have way too many kids that are playing too many formal games and they're not practicing enough. Adult programs imposed on kids. Structure, five on five, full ice. Kids are different than what adults are. We shouldn't be imposing the exact same rules and, and adult components on kids. A lot of times our preparation is geared to short-term outcomes. I know everybody wants to win. When I'm coaching, it's generally more fun to win than it is to lose, but that shouldn't be the outcome. That shouldn't be what we're searching for. It's the process along the way. But if it's tough for a lot of minor hockey coaches, and this is where, where you guys who are in the minor hockey associations as executives, need to back up your coaches and let them know it's not about winning. It's not about putting your best kids out there in the last minute of the game, every game, to see if you can win. We're not putting certain kids on a power play and only some kids get a chance to play in those special situations. 
Back up your coaches and let them know you're here to develop everybody. Every kid pays the same amount of money to join. They should all get the same opportunities to play and participate. And it's tough for coaches. You take your first few games of the season on the chin, you lose your first four or five, and you hear people as you're walking through the lobby of the rink, oh, we lost another one. Coach doesn't know what they're doing. Let them know it's not about the winning. If they have a plan and they stick to it, the outcome at the end of the year when it is a higher level of intensity, higher level of competition, winning will take care of itself. I was mentoring a Bantam AAA coach a couple of years ago, and he said, <clears throat> You know, we took a vote of the players at the start of the year and we asked them if they, we should have a first power play unit and a second power play unit. And they said the vote was unanimous. They all said yes. So I said that's pretty interesting. I said before you asked them to vote, did you tell them that they're all not going to be on the power play? No. I said, well, I'll guarantee the only reason they all voted yes because they all thought they were going to be on one of those two units. <laughs> as soon as they figured out that the only half of them was actually going to get on there, I'll guarantee your vote is 50-50 at best. So framing some of those questions is important to look at that. We talked about a couple of examples already today, knowledgeable coaches at our elite levels. There's no fame in coaching Pee Wee hockey. There's no fame in coaching Adam hockey. Everybody wants to get to the highest levels right away. Double A, triple A, pick on our friends in Toronto, quadruple A. We need to get our best teachers, our best instructors, our best coaches coaching at the younger levels. I would never ask a Mike Babcock, Joel Quenville, Ken Hitchcock to come in and teach skating to five-year-olds. I would ask someone who's had a lot of experience in teaching five-year-olds how to skate to come in and, and do that because they're the ones who are the experts. Okay? Our competition interferes with athlete development. Way too many times our seasonal structure affects our ability to develop athletes. We rush through tryouts at the start of the year only to get into our league games early, early, early on in the season. We rush through to get all of our league games done just so we can start playoffs in February. And like Steve said, every round of playoffs, 50% of the kids are eliminated. And guess what? February in Canada and most places it is winter. So now we have spring programs, summer programs out there who are capitalizing on the fact that a lot of kids are done hockey before they're actually ready to be done hockey. So they sign them up for three or four months. Now it goes until July. And guess what? We're putting kids on the ice 12 months a year. If we had a better seasonal structure, which gave more time for development at the start, start playing our games later on, have all the kids a chance to make playoffs, and playoffs should actually be a tournament, so everyone gets a chance to play right to the end of the year with the highest level of intensity and the highest level of competition. Now we're giving all of our kids an equal opportunity. And those are things that we as adults can do. We can look at our seasonal structure and say, why are we doing it? Because as someone mentioned earlier, well, we've been doing it this way for 25 years. Those are some practical things that in one aspect of the game, if we changed, we would keep a lot more kids playing deeper into the season at a higher level of intensity and competition, and we would get rid of the 12 month of year hockey. That will have a huge, huge benefit on what we're trying to do. Early specialization. The number of times I get emails from parents saying, the coach is saying my daughter cannot be a defenseman, wants her to play other positions, and the reply is, well, how old is she? Well, she's seven. We have to give kids a chance to play all positions and figure it out. You see the game from a different angle every single position that you play. The biggest area that's hurt us is in goaltending. Quebec used to be the goaltending factory. All those kids who have come through a system of goaltending where it was butterfly, drop, block, hope the shot hits you. We've lost our athleticism. We see six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds right now who have become a full-time goalie at that age. They got the goalie mask painted, 800 bucks for a mask. They got the skates, they got their own equipment and they're deciding they're going to be a goalie at seven years old and all their skating happens around the blue paint in the crease. They haven't learned to skate properly like the rest of the players. They don't handle the puck. They don't see the game. They don't have a hockey sense. We are turning out tons of little robots, but they get to a certain point and they cannot stop a puck. Kerry Price is the last goalie we had who had success at our world junior level and has gone on to a successful career in the NHL. And that was eight or nine years now. 
a couple other guys, maybe Steve Mason, you got a Jake Allen who's kind of coming through the system and just starting to get some, some playing time. No one else. It's because for a, an entire generation of goaltenders who were learning a blocking style, they topped out here. And we look at Finland, which is the goaltending factory right now, to be honest. Those kids don't become full-time goalies until they're 10, 11. And here's a really outside the box thing to think about. When you're 10 years old and you're playing on the Adam team in Finland and you're the backup goalie, you're not sitting on your butt, you're playing left wing, you're playing center, you're playing defense. You're not sitting there on the, on the bench and the coach is giving you a sheet trying to make you look busy and tracking shots. And you know they all just make them up by the end of the day anyway because they're bored halfway through the game. They're not even paying attention. <laughs> yeah, coach, we had 47-4. Uh, we only had seven shots against. But those kids that are, that are they're actually developing the hockey sense. They're not just early specialization within a late specialization sport. So some of the consequences, poor movement abilities, lack of proper fitness, poor skill development, bad habits. Bad habits are developed when you play too many games. NHL coaches, you hear it on the TV all the time, sports highlights, they go through a losing streak, what does every single one of them say? We gotta get back to fundamentals. We gotta get back to fundamentals. And with young kids, when they're playing too many games, they get away from that. They're not handling the puck, they're not thinking, they're not getting as many shots on net, they're not making as many passes, they're not receiving as many passes. They do not develop. Undeveloped, unrefined skills due to undertraining. Again, when we practice and practice and practice, that's where you get better. That's where the repetition comes from. It doesn't happen in games. Your average player gets one or two shots on net per game. Yeah, there's going to be some that get more, but there's going to be some that don't get any. But in practice, they should be taking 40, 50, 60, 70 shots on net. That's where you get to develop a better shot. Okay? A lot of the female athletes in our country, their potential is not reached because of inappropriate programs. Boys and girls are different. Yes, skating is the same to a 10-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl. But it's programs as they go through the system that need to be adapted to make sure they meet the needs of the girls and it's not just dropping them into a CAN program that is just for boys. I mentioned earlier, we need to really educate parents on this stuff. Those of you who have been around for a while, there used to be a poster campaign that was really designed around telling parents, don't just drop your kid off at the rink. Watch, get involved, participate. Well, nowadays, we actually want to go back to the old one. Yeah, drop them off and get the hell out of here. <laughs> Let us do what we need to do because the parents are over-involved. You don't see many parents going and sitting in a classroom in grade three and watching the teachers and critiquing. But they sure all show up at the hockey rink and make sure they tell all the coaches and everything what they, what they think they know. But again, it's okay for kids, for parents to want their kids to get to the highest level. It's about giving them the information so they have the best chance about getting there. So again, fundamental movement skills not taught properly. Failure, failure to reach optimal performance levels. Okay? Children not having fun as they play adult-based games. All the stuff we've heard already today, but they're, they're true, not just in hockey. It's in soccer, it's in basketball, it's in all kinds of sport. And selfishly for us at the national team level, we don't have a systematic development of the next generation of successful international athletes. It has to come through the system right from the bottom all the way up if you truly want to have success at the top. And it's no different than in any of the businesses or, or your work settings that you guys are in every day. Principal at a school is only as good as the teachers they have un underneath them. Starting from the teachers at the very lowest level, all the way through. That's success. Doesn't matter what your career is or what your job is. You need everyone in the organization pulling in the same direction. You're only as good as your weakest person. <clears throat> so how does this affect you guys? To me, for a minor hockey association, the two most important things that you need to look at when it comes to development is number one, consistency in the coaching philosophy. We need to find ways to get our coaches on the same page. They have to be doing common drills, common skill sets, so that as the players go from initiation into novice, novice coaches have a reasonable expectation of what those kids were taught and what they can do. Novice into Adam, Adam into Pee Wee, Pee Wee into Bantam. How many here are actually coaches, coaching hockey now? 
How many of you have said at the start of the year, after two or three or four practices, have said to yourselves, I can't believe what these kids can't do or what they don't know? I know, I think I've said it every year. I really hope the person who's coaching the kids I had last year isn't saying that right now, because that means I didn't do a very good job. <laughs> but we're, we're in a system, and, and Bob talked about it, the culture in this country, it's tough to change. We have a million experts. In your association, if you have this coach who's over here doing this thing and someone's over here and this guy's telling them to dump it in, this guy's telling them to dump it out, and she's over there telling them not, kids are getting mixed messages. You don't have a systematic way of developing players within your own association or a systematic way of developing coaches within your own association. We need to get our coaches on the same page. And that doesn't mean they need to agree on 100% everything. But we need to have consistency and saying, yes, we need to teach agility and quickness and balance and coordination on our skates. We need to teach them how to pass on the forehand and receive on the backhand. There's a core set of skills that every coach should be working on. And I would even recommend you go as far as saying, here's a core set of drills that every team should be doing. Every initiation team should be doing these six or seven core skating skills. Everyone should be doing these ones on puck control. And novice and Adam and Peewee. And what happens is you have a whole generation of kids who come through the system who can do all the things that they need to do to have success in hockey. <coughs> so from an association standpoint, number one, players have to enjoy coming to the rink. Hopefully everyone's having coaching meetings at the start of the year. And that has to be the first thing that is said. It should also probably be the last thing that is said. Make sure it is a good experience for these kids. Number two, improvement of the player skills. If you focus on that versus the winning, it will make a coach's life a lot easier. Even if you're coaching Adam hockey and you've lost six games, seven games in a row to start the year, I'll guarantee that coach goes to bed at night thinking about it. It bothers them. They're worried about what the parents are going to say. Are the kids going to stop having fun? Support the coaches in the development, not in the wins and losses. Players want to see themselves getting better too. The first time a player raises the puck, you might as well deliver a Stanley Cup because that's the biggest thing that ever happens. Then when they actually shoot it over the net, unbelievable. And then the kid who shoots it over the glass is the best player on the team by far. Whether they can skate or not, kids measure success by the little things, the little goals. It's like, did you see, did you see me raise it? Did you see that lifter? Those are the things that are successful to kids. And then ultimately it's developing players to get to the next level. And the next level doesn't necessarily mean junior or midget AAA. It means that Adam kids are still playing hockey in Pee Wee. As a coach, if every single one of your players is still playing this year that you had last year, you should just get a gold star for that coach of the year because you've done obviously a good job for those kids to keep playing. But as Steve said, you do not want to be player's last coach. Ultimately, with LTPD, if there are three lines that sum it up, it's keeping as many kids playing at as high a level as possible for as long as possible. In a perfect world, we have 100 kids starting this year at 5 and 6. Ten years from now, we have 100 kids still playing midget, and the same 100 kids. <coughs> In a better than perfect world, we've picked up a whole other bunch of kids along the way who are friends of those kids who decided they want to join. Unfortunately, our stats don't show that but we need to find a way to get as many kids playing as possible for as long as possible at as high a level as possible. <coughs> so by implementing that standardized technical curriculum and a methodology for instruction, you're going to get there. When coaches are on the same page, when they're talking about teaching skating and the skills of the game to help kids have success, that will happen. It sets the foundation. It's so important to have consistency. That's why we all have staff meetings at work, because we want people to be on the same page with what we're trying to do. Yes, it's okay to want to win, but the development component should not be compromised. One of the things we see, we get a lot of people email in our office or calling saying, yeah, I just finished playing pro hockey. I want to coach the uh, World Junior Team. Really, right, just, just like that doesn't happen that way. We have a lot of people, and you probably have a lot of people in your associations who want to just
to jump in and rest. I want to coach the AAA team or I want to coach the highest level team instead of being part of the process. But the process is where you find out who's actually good enough to be part of the outcome. And that's a quote I got from Steve, who I believe got from Skate Canada somewhere along the way. But that's where you find out who is worthy about being part of the outcome. There's experience along the way. So for us, very similar to what Bob said, every single player is on the pathway to high performance. We actually in our office don't consider high performance or a player high performance until the under 17 level where we bring in the top 112 best 16 year olds in Canada. And that is the first step of our high performance program. Up until then, Bantam AAA is not high performance hockey. Minor midget AAA is not high performance hockey. Midget AAA is not high performance hockey. All those players are on the pathway. They all have the potential, they all have the ability. If they work hard, if things go their way, lots of different factors when you get to that level, but they all have the potential. But until then, we don't consider it high performance. Everyone is on the pathway. But those are the things that we need to get people to understand. And so as a coach, they need to understand what are the skills and the tactics required to get players there. <clears throat> we have too many coaches, as Bob mentioned, trying to do the flow drills. They're doing NHL style drills with players. Steve and I were talking last night and I got a bunch of stats from our high performance group on the game itself. How much time in a 60 minute game do you think the puck spends between the blue lines and the neutral zone on average? Let's throw out a number. 70. 70. Did you say time or yeah, percent? yeah. 70%. Okay. Any other guesses? The average amount of time that the puck spends between the blue lines in your average NHL game is eight minutes. So out of a 60 minute game, we're looking at less than 20%. We're looking at 15%. Yet the number of coaches we see spending all their practice doing flow drills up and down the ice, up and down the ice, up and down the ice, when the puck spends mere seconds in the neutral zone, doesn't make any sense. When you divide the eight minutes in half because there's two teams out there, that means our national junior team only has the puck in the neutral zone on our stick for four minutes out of 60. And that's why you see coaches at the higher level spending all their time doing small area stuff. Because for the majority of the game, you have the puck in the offensive <coughs> zone, or you have the puck in your defensive zone, or you don't have the puck in either of those zones, and you're spending your time trying to get it back. So everything now is about small area skill, small area space, the ability to handle the puck, as Steve mentioned, within a stick length of your body. The one thing I would add to what Bob said is I agree the puck touches and all this and that, but the one thing we really focus on with our, our components now is when a kid has a puck, there should always be someone chasing him. Because that is the game. One of the hardest things for a coach to teach is for kids how to play without the puck. And you always talk, hear coaches talking about it. Our play away from the puck wasn't very good. So for me, every time I have a player with a puck on their stick, I want someone without it who's trying to get it. Because that is the game situation. You never spend any time in a game, rarely, where you're skating with the puck and there isn't someone coming after you. So you have to learn how to protect it. If you don't have it, you have to learn how to get it back. Michael Jordan led the NBA in points, majority of the time he was in the NBA. He also led the NBA in steals. So his ability to play defense and get the ball back is what enabled him to score all those points. <coughs> Six, seven years ago, they started doing that, keeping that stat in the NHL. Pavel Datsuk led the league in steals for the first five of the six years they started keeping the stat. Pavel Datsuk was also an unbelievable offensive player. But his offense was a lot in part because of how he could play without the puck. So we have to, we have to look at, and, and there's a lot of things that come into play here. But even with five-year-olds, if I have someone skating around pylons with a puck, I want someone behind him chasing him. I want him to want the puck. I want her to want to try and get the puck. And as they go through the system and get older, they will start to understand where do I have to be in order to get the puck back? Because I don't actually want to chase the whole shift I'm out there. I want to actually have the puck sometimes myself. So to have kids at a young age learn how to play without the puck so that they can get it back is an important component. As coaches, we've all said from time to time, man, how do I get the intensity up? 
They just don't seem like they want to go get the puck. That is something that can be taught and conditioned at a young age. So something to think about with your coaches when they're doing drills. For you guys that are coaching, add stress. Add a chaser. Add a game-like situation to everything you do. Because if they can do that in practice, it will start to show up in a game. So it's very, very important. Again, might be a little bit late as, as hockey started here, but talent identification, Steve mentioned a little bit about, is really about keeping kids around long enough so we can see what they can do. We are in such a hurry in this country to cut. Show up, first skate, here's a penny, here's a number, don't screw up, you only got one more chance to make the team. Two skates, kids are done. Two skates, kids are done. We're in such a hurry to go from here to here that we really have no idea the potential and the number of kids who could be great players that we are cutting from those teams. Bob mentioned with his son Ryan, said if he was living in a city, he probably wouldn't be in his 14th year of pro hockey right now. Because at the time, at 14, 15, when we really start to, to dwindle our numbers because we have to get down to the, the AAA teams, his son might not have played, he might have quit. So we need to find ways to keep more kids around long enough so we can see what they can really do. From an association side, I think this is as important a concept as you can have. If a coach selects a player to be on that team, it's the coach's job to develop that player and make sure they play and contribute. The days of only putting certain kids out at the last part of a period or the last part of a game should be over. Every kid pays the same amount of money. They all deserve the opportunity to develop and contribute. And every stage you go up, yeah, it's going to change a little bit. You might not have someone who's necessarily suited for a power play, but you need to give them a chance to find out. But if they're not on the power play, you need to find a way to make them contribute on the penalty kill. I had a buddy of mine, actually a good friend, who <clears throat> we used to have some pretty good conversations about this. He really thought that he should put his best players out there at the end of the period, the best players out at the end of a game all the time. And so we were actually on the golf course one day, and I... No word of lie, I actually did this. And I said, we got to the fourth hole or something, and I said, Jamie, you should just pick up the ball. He's like, why? So, well, you're not a very good golfer, and this is the hardest hole, so just, we don't want you to slow us down. And he's looking at me. And I said, no, serious, like, don't even bother hitting it. You're going to be in the trees or in the water. You're going to slow us down. Like, just pick it up and carry it. And he was fuming. And I said, you know what? That's your, that's your hockey theory. That's what you do to kids. And it has a way larger effect on kids than just that hockey game. Because guess what? They hear about it at school the next day. Opposing team or other kids. Hey, Susie, how was it like sitting on the, game, on the bench for the last seven minutes of the game? That stuff has a way bigger effect on kids than what any coach ever realizes in that time frame of a game. If any of us were invited to a staff meeting at work and told to leave halfway through when everyone else got to stay, the first thing that you're going is, is, what did I do wrong? Am I in trouble? How come I don't get to hear this? How come I'm not involved? All kinds of things start going through your head. And we're just telling kids right away, you're not good enough. And the worst part is, I've seen coaches who lose a game, who only play their best players. Now it's a lose-lose situation. You only played your best players and you lost the game. And the real old school part of it is the next practice, guess what? The infamous bag skate. But hey guys, we win as a team, we lose as a team. You're all skating. Well, the kids who never got to play, it's not their fault. Why are they skating? They should actually get to sit on the bench for that seven minutes and watch the best guys. <laughs> if, you, if you really want to be fair about it, that's, that's how it should work. But it doesn't. So, the, you know, again, a coach's job is to develop every player. And an association, for you guys as presidents and vice presidents and, and technical directors, you can play such a big role in making sure that these things come to life. Because if you back the coaches up to say, we want you to play everybody, then when you have parents complain, and some will, they think their son or daughter should be out there at the end or be on every power play, then there's backup. And it's not just the parent-coach confrontation. Because all players deserve the same opportunities. You never know who's going to flourish and become a great player. There's more and more players at the NHL level who were never drafted that are starting to make it. There's more and more players who never got drafted into major junior 
and are playing high levels. You just don't know. There's kids who are drafted in the first round of the NHL this year that will never play a game in the NHL. And there are people who are getting paid thousands and thousands of dollars to make that selection. And there's kids who were never drafted that are going to make it two years from now. Nobody knows for sure. And the younger the age, the less probability you have of actually selecting someone who you think is going to make it. Yeah, Connor McDavid comes along once in a generation. But that's one. Think of all the ones we've potentially lost because they didn't give, weren't given a chance. Seasonal structure, this is a really, really important one to me. <clears throat> Typically what happens in most places, school starts after Labor Day long weekend. Guess what is the first day of school is also what? First night of hockey tryouts. First day of school is stressful enough. The last thing we need to do is also put the stress of hockey tryouts on kids the same day. And this one really clicked into me after listening to Steve talk when he talks about the negative effects that stress has on performance. Stress of school, stress of tryouts, kids aren't getting enough sleep, not eating well enough, they're getting tired, guess what, they're sick, performance goes down. In my opinion, we should have no tryouts that start before Labor Day. Every kid should come in their first day of hockey, it should be five or ten skates of hockey school. Get everyone back on the skates, handling the puck, shooting the puck, no stress. Let the coaches get a chance to actually find out who these kids are. In smaller towns, the coaches probably already know, but regardless, we should still be giving them a chance before there's a formal evaluation or cutting process. <coughs> so to me, we should have hockey school before tryouts. We cut down way too early. The other thing is, most coaches right now probably do some sort of a warm-up before games. Go out in the parking lot, run around. Last thing you tell them is watch out for the bus, watch out for whatever else is driving around there, don't get hit by anything. Then they come back in, get ready for the game. Very, very, very few coaches in minor hockey doing anything for warm-ups before practice. And it's probably more important before practice. And I really saw this in Europe, where the Finns will tell their coaches and their parents, we're having 12 training sessions this week. 12 training sessions every week. Parents are like, oh my God, 12 practices? No, 12 training sessions. A training session is a 12-minute warm-up before you go on the ice at practice. Athletic, stations, tape ladders on the floor, hand-eye coordination, anything that's moving around, getting the body warmed up, getting the mind going. There's a training session. Then your practice, training session. After the practice, you don't just put your clothes on and head home. Another 12-minute athletic cool-down. And they have these little areas outside the rinks or sometimes in the rinks where there's all kinds of stations. And the players just go around. That's an extra 24 to 30 minutes of activity that they're not getting in schools. And guess what? The next day, you don't have to drive to your off-ice training. Now the next day is off. It's rest, homework, another sport, family time. And so they're making much more efficient use of their time in training kids versus we're here. And, and we saw it in Toronto with the uh, Super Sixes. Uh, five ice times a week and a dry land. At six, guess what? Half those kids have got blown out groins, sports hernias, burnout by the time they're 10. So we need to look at some of the ways that we've traditionally done things and say, most coaches can run a 20 minute athletic warm up before practice. Instead of the kids coming, they're sitting on the, on the bench and guess what? They're all on their phones, even at 10 or 12 nowadays. Then they get hurry up and get dressed in five minutes so they're not late for practice. Then they practice and they're not warmed up. <coughs> so they're, the first 10 minutes of practice is usually garbage anyway because they're, they're not even into it. Then they get off the ice and they go straight, straight home instead of saying, you know what? We want you to stay here for 15 or 20 minutes and here's an athletic cool down. Working on physical literacy, working on footwork, hand-eye coordination, balance, all those types of things. And your entire next day is off you've accomplished way more in one day than what you could have in two. To me, the playoff round's got to go. It is just ridiculous with kids how we cut, 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 round after round after round. And I'll pick in, in, in our Bantam AAA League in Western Canada, which is where kids get drafted in the Western Hockey League. Their tryouts start in August because their first league game is September 18th. And they rush through to get all the league games done by February 6th because they have 
five rounds of playoffs they have to get completed. So now August isn't even a summer month anymore because as soon as your tryouts start this middle of August, we're in conditioning camp, beginning of August or July. So now you've got the whole month, which should be time off. Kids are getting ready. They're trying to get prepped for tryouts. Tryouts last a short amount of time. Boom, pick the team right into competition. Before you know it, it's Christmas time. Not all the teams even make the playoffs currently. So every coach who's in, in danger of not making the playoffs, all they're doing is to try and win and get in. So there's no more development. And then playoffs start. So the actual development time for our top kids at the top age level in Western Canada is less than three months. Less than three months. And we wonder why we're not developing more higher end kids. Everyone should be in playoffs. Everyone should, should, <clears throat> should be doing those types of things. Again, the hockey school. There's no need to rush into it. Give the kids five or ten skates. Stressful enough. Kids are going out there when you only have one or two skates or three skates to make a team. All they're doing is trying not to make a mistake. They're not actually out there trying to show you what they can do. They're trying not to make a mistake because the tell person tells them, here's your penny, you're number 10. Have fun, don't screw up. Or as the term uses earlier, because then the coach is going to tell you you suck and you're gone. We need to keep them around longer. The warm-ups. They mentioned most teams are doing warm-ups before games. Higher levels will do a cool down, but before practice we're not. And when kids are actually on the ice for 60 minutes or 75 minutes or 50 minutes, whatever it is, and they're going the whole time, the warm-up is even that much more important to make sure that we're doing it. Physical literacy, literacy active, skill-based warm-ups. We will see a huge difference in what your kids can and can't do. Gives you that opportunity to eliminate the day-specific for this dry land training. And for some of you in small towns, you got someone who's running a gym probably, and they're trying to be the ones that want to get all those kids through there all the time. But you can still utilize them. Just tell them you want them to come and help out with this stuff. They're still used to having people who have knowledge or expertise in that area. It just doesn't mean that your kids have to drive there every single week and pay for it. Okay. And then the playoff rounds. It, what it does is it really stretches out the season. It gives more kids a chance to play at the end when it's the highest intensity and should be the highest level of competition. Then kids are ready to be done with hockey in March or April. They don't feel a need to jump into spring hockey. But I know in a lot of cases, if I, I grew up in a small town, northern Alberta. We never had a league. We, all we did was play tournaments. We played 15, practiced 15 times, went to a tournament. Practiced 15 times, went to a tournament. Practiced 15 times, went to a tournament. We didn't have playoffs. We played till they took the ice out of the rink and we were all ready to be done. Then you're playing golf, you're playing soccer, you're playing baseball, you're playing other sports. But for a lot of kids now, because they're done so early, they're not actually ready to be done hockey. So the money side of things in with the spring AAA stuff joins. And it's not like it lasts for eight weeks. It goes on for four months. Sometimes it goes on right through the entire summer. That's all the stuff that has really raised the cost of the games. It's how much money people pay for spring hockey versus what you pay for club hockey during the winter. So there's a lot of things that we can, we can look at here. One of the things we've done with this is put together guidelines for each age group. So for initiation, Guidelines on the number of practices versus number of games. How often should those be? What are the things <coughs> sorry, you should be considering? Small nets, blue pucks, cross ice, half ice, all those things. And these are available to everyone. We have a full 14 or 15 uh, presentation slide on every age group. So you guys will get one for novice, Adam, Pee Wee, Bantam, Midget. We have one for goaltenders. And it's all recommendations, guidelines on what an ideal season looks like. And it doesn't mean you have to have exactly 45 practices and 30 games. If you have 46 and 29, that's good. But if you have 45 practices and 60 games, that's not good. So it's a guideline to look at what does your seasonal structure look like at these age groups. Interesting thing in novice, someone will look at us and say, 
30 games, that's a lot. Well, if you go to a tournament and you get to play four jamboree style games or you're playing four games in a tournament, it's not like you're giving up four practices that weekend. So we basically count a tournament in reality as one game. So even though you might have 30, you go to four tournaments, you're really only playing 15, 15 games as far as a ratio goes. And like Steve said, like everyone said, games are good. Games are fun. Games are where you learn to compete. Games are where you want to score goals and you want to learn to, to have the puck. And similar to what Bob said, when we put out our long-term player development program, people said, well, Hockey Canada's taking away games. We're not taking away games at all. All we're doing is trying to restructure when those games happen. Less games at the start of the year, more games at the end. So there's a progression throughout the season. So it's development, 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 competition. It shouldn't be the other way around. And so you'll see a chart in Adam, Pee Wee Bantam Midget. We've got two different samples, community and developmental. And this is important because there's a lot of kids that want to play hockey, but they do not want to travel every second weekend. There's a lot of kids who want to play hockey, but less commitment, less structure. Traditionally, and especially in small towns, if you wanted to play hockey, there's really only one format you're going into. You pay, you practice three times a week, and here's our game schedule for the next five months. Traditionally, there hasn't been an opportunity for youngsters to come in and say, give me four or five practices at the start of the year, and we just want to play once a week. Because I ski, because I swim, I do other sports, music, whatever it is. Traditionally, those things haven't been available. We're seeing recreational programs in the city when you get into Bantam level with a thousand plus kids in them now. Because you're 14 and 15 year old, it's beer league without the beer, hopefully. They want to practice four or five times at the start of the year and I just want to go every Thursday night at seven o'clock and play with my buddies. I know I'm not playing junior, I know I'm not going to the NHL, I still like the game, but I want an option to play. <coughs> and we're seeing some very, very skilled players joining that option now who would be good enough to play Bantam AAA or Midget AAA. But they have other interests that are taking over, but they're still in the game. We're not losing them from the game solely at 15 because the option to play is only this and that's something they can't commit to. It's hard for parents who have two or three kids in other activities to play competitive hockey. So there's lots of factors, but our number one goal should be to keep kids in the game, so let's put some options in there. Another one, I was a small, in a small town where I grew up, and we always used to do the tournaments. We always had two teams in every age group, and we balanced them as equal as we could. And both teams would go to a tournament. Along the way, we had some overzealous parents who said, well, you know what, let's, let's go an A team and a B team, so we can kind of put the better guys here and the weaker ones here, and, and let's go in the league. So now you're going driving an hour on Tuesday night and you drive another two hours on Saturday, play your game, two hours home. So before you know it, there were six hours of your day and you're basically sitting the whole time. You weren't even actually doing anything. And over the course of two years, they only dropped down to only having one team in each age group now. Not because kids or parents didn't like hockey, but because they couldn't live with the commitment that had to go with it. So the tournament style was way more efficient. I'll guarantee you're not getting anything further ahead by playing in a league where you're playing three games a week and you have to travel all over the place, than if you practiced for three weeks straight and went to a tournament and played those same four teams in one location. Costs a lot less money, and from a coaching and development standpoint, you're actually doing a lot more for your kids. So again, for associations, I would really look at your structure. Say, do we really need this league? Do we need to have that format? What are we doing with our playoffs? Is it round after round or is it tournament style? you will start to see the money you're going to save will actually enable you to do more things development-wise if you have to bring in a skating coach or you want to put on clinics or you want to do different things like that. It's going to give you a lot more resources to do the things that you want to do. And so we've put a specific presentation together for just Bantam and Midget Age Group. All the skills required to teach, what they should be teaching at that level, what a season should look like for a competitive or a recreational style, and it's all age specific. Alternate seasons. Another thing that scares a lot of people off, and especially at the young ages, is they hear that, you know what, we sign up for hockey, we're in it for six months. Why not have a try hockey? Make a six week program, 10 week program, 
a three-month program where someone can just sign up from September to December if they want. Or January to March. We're doing that with some of our younger programs, like the First Shift, if anyone's heard of that, or, or the program that comes along. Opportunity for kids to come and try hockey for six ice sessions. That's it. If they like it, now we're going to transition into a mainstream. But we need to start doing things like that because there's so many options for families and people out there now. We can't just keep doing what we've always done in the trad traditional sense of the word. may not work in smaller communities, but in some places the, I the ice is in 12 months a year. Why not offer a program for kids in the summer who just want to play in the summer because maybe they're doing something else in the winter? We mentioned it. Have a collaboration with your local soccer and your local baseball program. We're not opposed to spring skills. I think it's okay for kids who want to be on the ice in April, May and do skill stuff. Work on skating, work on shooting. Get rid of the games format. But they should also have the opportunity to play lacrosse and soccer and baseball and everything else. And I think it was Steve that mentioned so many small town communities right now, they're all competing for the same kids. The associations aren't working together to say, we're doing spring hockey skills on ice where we're putting tons of kids on the ice and it's repetition on Monday, but that same age group of soccer happens to be on Monday at the same time. So now we're competing for the same kids. So working together as a community sport association versus just a individual sport association will go a long way. <coughs> Multi-sport, Ohio State, Urban Meyer football coach. 42 of the 47 athletes on the roster were multi-sport athletes in high school. Only five of them only played football. A lot of the major sports teams are looking for kids who are multi-sport athletes, not sport specialized football players or hockey players. Tom Brady drafted a Major League Baseball. Russell Wilson drafted a Major League Baseball. A lot of the top players in every single sport are great athletes. And the more of an athlete you are, the higher your ceiling and potential is to get to higher levels. And if that doesn't happen, at the end of the day, you're still active as adults. Like I said, golf is the only sport if you're not good at, you'll still go play a week. If you're not good at basketball, most of us aren't playing basketball right now on the weekends. If you're a terrible tennis player, you're not really playing tennis anymore. So the more sports we get kids doing at a younger age, the better off we're going to be. Just the video of Crosby talking about different sports that he played as a kid, but we won't, we'll skip that one. But the greatest difference in our kids' sporting experience on our own is the rise of year-round sports-specific organizations that ask or even require season after season of participation in order to stay in the player development pipeline. That never happened for most of us when we were kids. Off of the skates, put them in the bag, take it out four months later, hope everything fits. Okay? But the pressure to have your child specialize in a single sport at a young age has never been stronger than it is right now. And it is not the best thing for the kids. But we also know what's a challenge. You've got neighbors on either side of you. And Johnny over here is playing AAA hockey in the spring. You're thinking, well, you know what, if I, if I don't do it, we're going to fall behind. Which leads back to the benefit of having hockey school before tryouts in the fall. So that you get kids back on the ice who maybe didn't go to five weeks of hockey school. In two weeks, they're going to catch up an awful lot. The kid who went to five or six weeks of hockey school straight, by November, that's as good as they're going to get. They're already getting tired, they're getting burnt out. The other kids, if they were actually allowed to be kept around long enough, are the ones who are going to progress and be better at the end of the year. Best players are the best athletes. From a data side, again, Ohio State University. Children who specialize in a single sport count for 50% of the overuse injuries in young athletes. That should be enough right there for parents to, to look at it and say, you know what? Kids who only play one sport, overuse injuries are going to happen. Kids who specialized early in a single sport led to higher rates of adult physical inactivity. They got burnt out. They got tired. They don't like the sport anymore because all they did every single day was that sport. I know you're going to have parents who are going to tell you, you know what, my son or daughter just wants to be on the ice every single day. They just love it so much. 
guess what? They'd love to eat Fruit Loops for breakfast, for lunch, and supper every day too. But as an adult, at some point, we have to put the balance in place and let them know, yes, we know you love it, but that is not the best thing. Video games, they'll play them hours and hours and hours when they first get them, but three months later, you're using it as a coaster. It's collecting dust. So it has to be balance. Early specialization in a single sport is one of the strongest predictors of injury. You get worn down, you get tired. The amount of young kids we're seeing with chronic groin problems at a young age from just skating, skating, skating all the time. Hip problems, sports hernias. The number of young baseball players right now in the major leagues who are going through Tommy John surgery because they've thrown so many curveballs at a young age that their elbows are gone. That used to be an old man surgery. Now they're having it at 20 years old. Last year at the end of the year, the Anaheim Angels had five pitchers on their staff under 25 who were all going through Tommy John. And they traced it all back to overuse and doing inappropriate, non-age appropriate things when they were young. Far greater risk of burnout or stress. The kids who are always playing hockey 12 months a year and always told how good they are, all of a sudden they get to a certain point when they're not the best anymore. That is trauma on a lot of kids. The ones who are the best at 8 are usually not always the best at 16. Or the ones that are best at 12 are not always the best at 14. You just don't know. Okay. Early sports specialization in female adolescents associated with increased risk of anterior near pain, knee pain. Okay and higher rates of ACL tears. That should be enough right there for any parent to say, I do not want my daughter to tear an ACL, we better make sure we're doing different things. The payoff is not worth it. Multisport, Wayne Gretzky talking about multisport. It's interesting um, when, when you look at people who put their kids in spring hockey again and we talked about the time on ice and, and one shift on the ice, two or three shifts on the bench. At those young ages, the ability to develop your lung capacity is going to be far greater improved by playing soccer where you're running and active the whole time than going into another sport that you just came off of for eight months. There's a lot of other things that we can be doing that are going to have a great impact and a positive effect on sports performance later on because of those windows of adaptation that Bob showed and Steve talked about when you're learning fine motor skills, when you can learn, start to develop future lung capacity, those things are very important. <clears throat> Just a couple of videos before we uh, wrap up here. This one was done by Sport Nova Scotia and it's a, it's a parody on sports parents but I think you're, as you watch it you'll see some things that'll uh, Ring home with everybody. Who wants to go first? Hi. I'm Jill. I'm a recovering soccer mom. Hi, Jill. Ever since Bailey was five, I've been driving her to early morning practices, after school games, weekend tournaments, summer camps, indoor winter league, sprouting league. Sprouting? Spring slash autumn. I lived in my van and never saw my husband, but it was okay because my sacrifice was making Bailey a better player. But we encourage our kids to play sports so they become better people. Tell that to the little brats huh, who play other sports during the rest of the year and then steal all the spots on the soccer team. Perhaps those kids are better athletes because they play other sports? That makes no sense. Hmm? Bailey is out there every day. Kicking the ball until her feet are numb. So you say that like it's a good thing. Yes, and then one day out of nowhere, Bailey tells me that she doesn't 
doesn't want to play soccer anymore. She can't even look at a soccer ball. After all the years I put in. How old is Bailey now? Going on seven. Why? When a child plays only one sport, sometimes they have a higher risk of suffering repetitive injuries. They can burn out and they get burned out sports altogether. I found myself at five o'clock in the morning the other day sitting in the bed, but I realized I'm not a soccer mom anymore. Encourage Bailey to try different sports. So I shouldn't have sold the bed. Or would anyone else like to share? <laughs> Hi, I'm Todd. Hi, Todd. I bet the firm on my son playing at the NBA. Literally, I took out a second mortgage on the family farm to pay for basketball camps. Things were looking great for a while. Justin made varsity in middle school, but then... Did he get injured? Worse. He stopped growing. He's 5'5". Five, five. Genetics is a cruel mistress. I can't even look my own son in the eye now. It's not because he's so darn little. Is it because you're going to lose the farm? No. Because he's playing on the JV team. But is he having fun? I never asked. Maybe you should talk. We're with you, Todd. As a parent, you just want to see your child succeed. Our Daniel could have played in the NHL. He went to all the day camps, straight into night camp, hockey school, hockey hockey. Hockey hockey? Twice the hockey, in no school. We thought he was the next Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> he wasn't even the next Brent Gretzky. Hasn't been on skates in 15 years. Early sports specialization can actually hurt a child's overall athletic development. And by encouraging their son to only play hockey, they may have actually hurt his chances for succeeding. But what is Daniel doing now? David doesn't like to speak about it. It might help to share. He's a... My son is an astronaut. I still have all his hockey here. Except he's the skate sharpened. He's still draft eligible. He's 34 years old. Courtney, I'll play until he's 50. You need to get over it. I know. Bringing it is the first step. How about you? Would you like to share? I'm Wade. I'm only here because my son beat me. And why is that? He says I'm trying to live vicariously through him. Is that true? <laughs> yes. Um, well, let's all remember why we encourage our kids to play sports. To win. To be a star. And to get rich. We encourage our kids to play sports so they can have fun. Uh, and, and, and socialize and learn to be part of a team. Is forcing our child to play only one sport and then putting a whole lot of pressure on them to succeed a really healthy thing to do? No. Good. Repeat after me. The, the ones that want to get there. Everything is there, it's all contained in, in, in one spot. Lots of video information. There's tons of resources out there that's still accessible. Trevor and, and Mike and, and, and Jason and Aaron from HNO have done a really, really good job in accommodating all this stuff, making sure it's available. Mike's going out to doing tons of clinics, and as Bob said, call Mike, we'll do a clinic every weekend for the rest of the world. But there's, there's people out there that want to help. There's people out there that are willing to help. And, you know, as we talked about, you know, when you look at developing players, you don't need to have a power skating expert come into your association. Your coaches don't need to be power, power skating experts. So what they do need is to look at some videos so they can set it up and have the kids work by like itself. It doesn't require someone to be an expert. And when it comes to skating and that type of stuff, there's no point and putting kids through structured power skating lessons until they're done their growth spurt. All the research shows that everything before that should be agility, balance, coordination, speed. It's not about working on the perfect stride because as soon as they grow, everything changes. So all the money that you spent on power skating instructors or skating instructors or going to the power skating camps could be out the window if your kid grows six months or six, six inches over the next six months because now everything changes from a biomechanical standpoint. So we really encourage agility, balance, coordination, north, south, east, west, quickness. That is the most important stuff, and that is the important parts of how the game was played nowadays at the NHL. Small area, skill, and quickness is the most important thing. But again, any number of things, if Mike can send you guys a Dropbox, so we have additional resources on anything you could possibly want on all this. But the important thing is to take time to look at it. Take time to pass it on to the coaches in your organizations. Have general meetings. Have people come over and talk to them, to each other, and put plans together on how you want to put this stuff in place. Because at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the individual communities to do what they need to do.
we can put mandates in place to our level of Hockey Canada, but we don't have the ability to go into every single community and say, are they doing doing this stuff? So you're really relying on, on, on people in the local communities to be doing the right thing. And the right thing for every community is not the same across the country. What works here might not work here. So you have to have the ability to adapt it and change it. But when you're looking at the overall principles of trying to keep kids in sport and give them all the potential to get to wherever it is that they want to get to, that's the important thing that we, that we need to look at. So, um, again, I'll provide this presentation and my email and, and, and stuff to Mike. You can feel free to pass it on to everyone at the end of the weekend. Hope they don't get anything that's going to have a beauty school over right here, but <laughs> at the same time, you never know. So anyway, thanks a lot, everybody, and have a good weekend.